All right, so uh, module one is just basically like, hey, this is ethical hacking. This is LabSim. This is how you use LabSim, which you guys probably don't need. Um, you should be LabSim pros by now, um, whether you like it or not. Uh, but it did talk about like the white hat versus gray hat, um, stuff that we already know. Um, but we are going to fast track right to chapter two or module two with what is penetration testing. Okay. So in ethical hacking, there's multiple different things that fall under cybersecurity, right? There is vulnerability management. There is blue teaming, which is when you're on defense. There's red teaming, which is where you're attacking. There's purple team, which is like a little bit of the middle ground, okay? But penetration testing specifically is what we are going to focus on, okay? So a company will hire you and they're not just looking to say, hey, what vulnerabilities do we have on our systems, right? We want you to actually put on your hacker hat and actually test these vulnerabilities and see if you can make entry into our network, into our building, doing those red team exercises. So that's what we're gonna break down, okay? It's that a strong defense is through a stronger offense and actually testing these things. So the 15 or so modules that we're gonna go through are going to teach you the skills that are needed to be able to do penetration testing, which is hacking into machines. And like I've mentioned before, by the end of the year, there's just gonna be an IP address up on the board where you guys just, that's the assignment, is actively engage in that target and see if you can find the vulnerabilities, take advantage of those vulnerabilities, get a foothold and get to the root user, okay? So that is often, um, those are those type of exercises are usually called boot to root um, because they are designed on the website like Volm Hub and other websites. They're designed for you to set up that virtual machine and then try to attack it and get that root user, okay? That root user has access to everything on the system. So once you have access, so let's say it's a web server and you're the root user, then you can change what the website is saying. You could inject some code to be able to, you know, get a user's information. You could get all of the data from the database and get all of the user information to, you know, if the bad guy could then, you know, do some type of identity theft or sell all that user information, okay? And that's done by getting that root level access, okay? So going through, we're gonna start off with the actual process in which you go through and um, do ethical hack or penetration testing, okay? So um, like I mentioned before, you have basically two teams, okay? You have your red team and your blue team. In the fall, starting in the spring, um, we're going to start doing some CTFs, they're called, so capture the flag exercises. Uh, we did a couple things like this last year. Um, if you remember the um, Cyber Patriot and some of those other ones where we try to get information in order to solve those rooms. So we are then the red teamer that is trying to figure out these things, whether it's cryptography, whether it's um, actually finding vulnerabilities, we'll be doing those exercises as part of the curriculum, okay? And these are a great way for you guys to get scholarships and get noticed in the cyber world so that way you can have a successful career in cybersecurity. So the first thing that we're gonna do, and this is, there's many different processes, 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 I don't know, that are out there when it comes to how you attack a machine or how you approach a job, okay? And in the real world, if you will, You'll, there's this whole setup where you sit down with the um, department that you're working with, whether that's the IT, you know, if IT is having you test these things or it might be management and IT doesn't even know about you doing this because they're testing kind of their response. But you'll first sit down, like before you do any of this, you'll sit down and you will talk about um, contracts, making sure they're being signed, um, covering what is the footprint that you can attack. So if they only have you working on their internal servers then the or the maybe the sandbox servers or their production servers and you do stuff on their production stuff instead of their testing stuff that's going to be outside the scope and then you would technically be liable for that so if you did get access to data there's been so many studies that are out there and so many news reports where 
they went outside scope and then they were held, they were charged criminally for doing that. So you wanna make sure that all of your I's are dotted, your T's are crossed to make sure that you know it's very clear what you're supposed to be hacking into. Because if you're outside of that realm, then you are held liable, okay? But once we actually start the ethical hacking process, the first thing that we're gonna do is recon, okay? What is a tool that we've already used that could be used for reconnaissance? Any ideas? Yep. Nmap. Nmap, okay. So Nmap can be used, but when we actually look at like recon and footprint compared to like scan and enumerate, where does Nmap kind of fall in, do you think? More of the scan. More of the scan, so that's gonna be like our second tool. The first thing, reconnaissance and footprint. Wireshark. Wireshark. So, do you think that Wireshark would be recon, or would that be more scanning? Oh, scanning? Right. So, before you even get to that step, Google. Right. We can Google the target. We can look at their maybe there's board information. Let's say the school district is our target. We can look at their previous board minutes and see what are they purchasing. Okay, they're purchasing Dell servers. Okay or Dell devices, okay? Then we can start crafting our attack based on what we know that they purchase, okay? So just by that one piece of information, we can kick off a social engineering attack in which we become a Dell rep. Hey, I just wanna let you know that I'm taking over as your um, Dell representative and um, I saw that you know we had done some you know these work. I just wanted to make sure everything worked well with that, that the previous person you know didn't drop the ball, I mean, how can we help you? Also, if you could um, fill out this informational thing so that way I can put you into my contacts and then that could kick off kind of our social engineering attack, right? So we might not even want to get started with Nmap and stuff like that if we can craft a social engineering attack because what is the weakest part of any computer system? The users, the users right? So if we can take that easy route, cool. But a lot of times when you're engaged in these, they'll have like a separate like phishing and social engineering like program that they're going through. And even we have one here where we pay a company to um, try to fish our users to, and they get a report back for like who opened emails and stuff like that. Um, and at the end of the day, the company doesn't necessarily, they don't value social engineering attacks in my opinion as much. Like they're, they're hiring you to actually like test their systems. So if that's the case, we want, to, we want to start getting as much information as possible. We also might look at Google Maps, right? See how it's actually laid out. Are there fences? Are there gates? Are there, is there any information on um, like badges? Maybe you can do an image search and maybe find a Career Center badge. Um, you can, again, see the layout of the building, see if there's, like I said, fences, gates, um, even like generators, and see what type of information is out there. We can also do more, and this is starting to get into the scanning, uh, but we could just look at their online records. So what I mean by that is looking at their DNS entries. Remember, DNS entries are what take us from our IP addresses to our human readable or human enterable characters, right? Google.com goes to a certain IP address, okay? So we can look at that and see, okay, what are their exterior facing services? They might have an email server that is an exchange server that is not like cloud-based and it's actually located in the building. Cool, that could be our internal, our way to get into their eternal network, okay? We could start doing recon and start seeing what type of services they have, what type of physical, like what the physical layout is and stuff like that. The next thing then would be to scan and enumerate. So um, scanning with Nmap, scanning with Wireshark, if we could get like on the network, Wireshark would help us. Um, from there, we're gonna gain access, right? So we're going to enumerate, we're gonna see, hey, this one server that they have has port 443 and port 80 open. What kind of server is that most likely? That's a web server, right? Because that is port 80 for regular HTTP and 443 for secure. So if that's the case, then we can go through and try to get access, okay? From there, we are going to, um, oops, let me go back. So from there, once we gain access, we need to maintain access. So that might be adding a user account, 
to the actual device. It could be um, putting a script in that automatically dials home, so that way we can get our reverse shells. Uh, we can go through, and if they do see that we're on the admin user, let's say, we want to have our secondary way of connecting to that device. So we might actually go into, if it is a web server, we might go modify some of the files and add a way for us to get back in. And the last thing is to clear our tracks, right? So if we maintain entry, we are able to get in, we can make changes, and then we want to clear any log files and stuff like that, okay? So with the enumeration step, what we're trying to find is what are the devices on the network? What are the services that they are running? Most of the things that we're going to deal with here are, it's almost the same thing every time. We're going to use nmap to scan. While that's running, we are going to go, we're going to see if port 80 is open. We're going to go see if, you know, there's a web server that's like running on the device. And then from there, we are going to see, hey, what services is this running? Is it a web server? Is it, does it have shares that are available? Like if there's SMB shares, then there's some weaknesses that are built in. I don't know if you remember last year, but we, um, I'm pretty sure we tried the blue machine. Or at the beginning of this year, we tried the blue machine. They just kind of go together after a little bit. But blue takes advantage of a um, vulnerability with SMB. So from there, we're doing a scan. We're seeing, okay, these are the ports that are open. Then we are going to craft different possible attacks. You don't want to just rush into one. You want to try to build out your methodology. And just because... I like using Nmap, you might find a better tool out there, right? There are other tools that are much faster than Nmap. They're built on Rust and these other technologies. So again, I'm going to show you just the kind of the step-by-step -step in which I would attack something, but that doesn't necessarily mean I don't want you to always follow what I do. I want you to go research. I want you to find other tools. I want you to share those with the group so that way we can all be better. We can just be able to develop our own methodology for this, okay? So from there, there's a couple different things like as far as the processes that we can do. So what I mean by that is um, we can you know, try to get them to click on a Trojan that opens up access. And we'll be building these things. Okay? We'll be building viruses. We'll be doing you know, spyware. We'll be doing all that stuff as part of this curriculum. But from there, we got to figure out like maybe there are no open servers. So we have to come up with another way to get in, which is probably going to be a social engineering attack. So that way we can have that user give us action or um, the availability, give us access, not action, and the availability to access that service. Okay. So finally, um, after we get and maintain our access, the next thing that we're going to need to do is report out. And I can share with you a bunch of um, pen testing like reports that I've done that kind of showcase like what vulnerabilities are there. Um, one of the tools that I really like using, um, it is a paid service, they might have a free tier, is pentest.ws. And I do all of my um, notes and stuff in that application because then it'll generate that report for me. But also there's a place that like once you put your Nmap results in there, it automatically brings up like some of the most common tools that we use. It'll have all those commands pre-built for you so you can copy, paste them in, and just be faster at what you're doing, okay? Another thing is, so maybe we see that there's a server has port 80 and port 443 open, okay? Just keep letting Nmap run, but then in the background, navigate to that website, okay? See what's on that website, just click around. Students, I've seen students get hung up on just focusing on Nmap and then trying to do like a Metasploit, um, you know, try to just use Metasploit in order to, you know, get into the machine. That's like going to a locked car and just wanting to use a Slim Jim to pop the door, okay? Or just using, you know, wedges to open it up and using the long arm to open it up. Like people just want that easy way. And a lot of times the boxes that we're going to do aren't just going to be scan, find vulnerability, use Metasploit, get access. The first couple that we do are. But outside of that, that's not what's going to be the most common when it comes to um, actual industry, right? Chances are they're doing updates, so a lot of those things are patched. They're not running older services. And you can't just say, oh, it's secure, because I couldn't use Metasploit to get into it. 
because, and that's what I try to explain to, um, like I was telling you about like the quality program review, like a penetration test is only as good as the ethical hacker that's doing it, right? So for you guys, you'll be pretty novice. So for you to go in to a company and be like, hey, I tried to hack into your systems and I couldn't get in, so it's all good. It's probably not worth as someone who has been doing this for like 15 years, having them come in and say, yep, you're good to go, right? Because you just need time to develop your skills and your credentials. Now, if you are passionate about cybersecurity and you go get your certified ethical hacker, you go get your certifications that prove you know what you're doing, that's one way that you maybe being a little bit younger can help you get those jobs or get, you know, start up your own penetration testing um, business. But you do have to put the time in in order to do it. So all of that was to take me to the next point, which is the OWASP. So the OWASP top 10 is the Open Web Application Security Project. And with OWASP, every year they come out with what are the top 10 vulnerabilities. So most of the time, this is what you are testing for when it comes to your clients, right? Most of the time they have web facing applications, uh, more and more, I mean, look at what you guys use here, right? You use mostly web applications in your day-to-day -day life, whether that's even like Discord is a, you know, that is a shell of an application, but on the back end, it's all web services that are going back and forth. So with that, Gmail, um, Google Classroom, those are all web applications. So banks, insurance companies, all of these companies that would hire you, they want you to be looking at these things because these are the top 10 um, every year that are the most common issues, okay? So with OWASP, you'll go through them one by one and there'll be things like um, being able to inject code into a login page, right? And being able to modify the database just from a you know, name, address, phone number, you can put some code in there and inject it and now you have root access to their database and you can like dump all of the um, passwords and stuff like that. That's what they're looking for. There was actually schools back in the day like when computers were um, new that, and there's actually a comic about it, was like, why did you name your son like drop tables? Because it basically deleted everything in the entire database, right? And you know, basically they no longer had any student data because that vulnerability was there. They weren't set up to sanitize the input from the user, um, so they were able to make modifications. So when you hear about the data breaches and the data leaks that are out there from all these big companies, it's because most of the time they were able to find a vulnerability in the web app that allowed it to not work how it was supposed to be working and they were able to get access to those credentials. So that's what people are gonna be asking you to, um, to test for. So OWASP is a big one. Um, the OSS TMM is another one. NIST is the, um, I would say NIST is the best thing to focus on when it comes to understanding um, kind of security frameworks. Um, it's not meant to be like the end all be all. It's just put there in order to say, as a school district, these are the best practices. Here's some templates. This is what you should be doing which is good if you wanna start your own consulting business because you could go through NIST and develop all of your product offerings based on the NIST standards because then you could say, I've gone through and this is my process that I take you through. I go through and look for XYZ per the NIST guidelines and that kinda of has some clout because this is the national standards that we use for security and technology. So definitely take some time to look at NIST, um, especially once you go into IT, if you're ever tasked with like creating any best practices or you're creating any policy, NIST can be a great place for you to do that. So moving on to the different types of penetration testing that you'll do. Black box, white box, and gray box. Now, just because we're talking about computers here, this could also be physical penetration testing, right? So black boxes, you know nothing about it at all, and they're like, hey, good luck. So this is like the highest level, if you will. 
And from there, you kick off your recon. You try to find, do they have anything public facing? If they don't, how do we get on the inside of their network? Does the scope of work include us making physical entry into the building? So that way we can get to their physical data center and maybe um, get root access from like the console, stuff like that. So that's black boxes, not knowing anything about what's going on with that system or that institution. The next thing is white box, where they basically tell you everything about it. Like, hey, this is the software that we're running. Here is the actual code to go through if you want to find some vulnerabilities. Here's a desk that you can come in here and work from, right? So with that, you see absolutely everything. And then using our powers of deduction, what is gray box testing? Yeah. A little bit about everything. So they might just give you an IP address and a desk to work from, right? Like, hey, you can get on our network. Here's the IP address of what we want you to test. We're not going to tell you anything else about it. We're not going to give you the code. We want you to just, like, if someone were to, like a guest or someone was able to get on the network, what could they potentially do, okay? So those are the three main ones. So with black box, no prior information. This simulates more of our outside attacks. Um, so it could be someone outside the network that's local or from the other side of the world. Um, usually that's the most expensive, right? Because you're going to have, you're, it's going to take the most time. So, you know, an ethical hacker that's making, you know, over $100 an hour, like that's going to be a very costly exercise. And that's why a company might opt to do a gray box or a white box test because it's not going to take as much time, which means they're not going to have as much um, resources kind of dumped into it. The net white box test, obviously, um, very comprehensive, line by line code, stuff like that. And then gray box tends to be more of like an insider threat, someone that is able to come into the network and um, someone is able to come into the network like a guest. So what is, if you were to, um, someone were, from the outside were to ask you, what would you say, what is penetration testing? Anybody want to take a stab at it? What is penetration testing? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Yes. Right. So we're putting on, we are simulating an attack of some sort, and a company is paying us to do that, right? So a, co a company is paying us to ethically hack into their um, servers, their services, their building, whatever that might be. Um, who would be one performing a penetration test? Who performs penetration tests? Any guesses on that one? Yeah. yeah hacker. The ethical hacker, right? So that's going to be you guys. So once you get your certified ethical hacker, once you get your pen test plus or the various other um, certifications that are out there, then that's going to be you guys, right? And I can tell you, like, the CEH, or the Certified Ethical Hacker, um, it sounds really cool, number one. Number two, it's, it's accepted kind of across the industry as the entry-level certification. Um, and it shows that you know the tools that are required to do ethical hacking. And then finally, uh, what are the three different types of penetration tests that are out there? We just talked about them. Absolutely, white box, black box, and gray box. So since the rest of you are sleeping, I'm going to go ahead and end there. Uh, we will pick up with 2.2 tomorrow, and that is going to be our different threat actors. Any questions? Cool.